Our next presenter is an expert in computer vision, which, to my limited understanding, is a way of analyzing digital images and trying to understand them with the goal of automating what our eyes can do, what, what human vision can do. It's really advanced stuff. And I've gotten to know him a little bit during Starmus. You're in for a high energy talk. My friends, please welcome to the Starmus stage, Philip Tarr. Thanks. Okay, uh, first of all, it, can you hear me? It sounds like you probably can because it's ringing in my ears. And uh, I'm just, well, super excited to be here, sharing the stage with so many great inspirational people. Thanks, uh, Garrick and uh, Sir Brian. Like, uh, I think this has just been the most amazing event. Uh, I've also, um, I mean, it's amazing that it's organized by Brian because actually for a long time, because of uh, our, you know, glorious hair, I was actually referred to as Brian by my friends. So, you know, that's kind of uh, uh, an additional thing. So, um, the talk is going to be AI to the people. Uh, so, what does that mean? I guess um, we're entering probably um, what a singularity, a, a new industrial revolution, a time which is going to change us in ways we can't predict. And, you know, this AI revolution is going to change all of our lives. And, um, as such, I'm not going to talk so much about my own work, uh, but I'm going to maybe um, uh, use some thought experiments to suggest where we might um, go. And these, um, I'm, I'm going to actually assume um, two things, okay? And I don't think these things are unreasonable. So um, at some point in the future, uh, the AIs that we're all developing, Bernard, myself, uh, the big tech companies, um, is going to achieve um, some sort of artificial general intelligence. And I'm going to say what that means uh, in a little while. And also, um, we am going to actually, at some point in the next 100 years, make huge advances in robotics so that um, you know, the robots themselves will have probably human uh, capabilities um, and maybe even be cheaper than us. And I'm going to actually make these two assumptions, which I don't think are unreasonable, and I'll tell you why. And then um, we have to think, how do we want to shape our society? If these two things are true, how do we ensure everybody benefits from, uh, in society? Um, and that it's not just benefits for a few and lots of people unemployed or out of work. So I think uh, this is for all of us to think about. Um, let's see if this works. Oh, that's cool. Okay, so it's not a scientific talk. And actually, so I'm a fellow of the Royal Society. And uh, actually, Adrian Smith, who's the uh, uh, president, he was asked, um, you know, uh, uh, somebody said, why don't the uh, public trust scientists? And actually, um, you know, in general, I think the public do trust scientists when they talk about science. They just um, don't necessarily trust scientists when they tell them how to run their lives. Um, but that said, I'm going to make a few suggestions and you can, uh, you can take it or leave it, depending on uh, uh, what you think. So why listen to me? Um, so I, I'm a professor at Oxford. Uh, I used to work at Microsoft, and I've been involved in a, founding a bunch of um, uh, some successful, uh, a couple not successful spin-outs. And, uh, um, you know, I run a, a research group that uh, started off as a computer vision group uh, on image understanding and now works on all aspects of machine learning. And actually, uh, just to show you what computer vision is, so back in the 90s, I worked on um, 3D reconstruction. So this was um, uh, a system that we later commercialized. Uh, I had a lot of great collaborators, including my supervisor, Andrew Zissiman. Uh, we did feature tracking, so you could uh, track some features. These are the features tracked. And then from that, it would automatically work out where all the cameras were. It would work out the, uh, the uh, 3D. And um, then you could actually use that to insert uh, uh, computer-generated uh, graphics and uh, uh, you know, uh, insert them consistently. And um, 
yeah, so this, was, this work later on uh, uh, got uh, commercialized. We made a company, 2D3, and it got used in all of the, uh, the major films. And uh, it won a technical Emmy. Uh, it got used in Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings. Here's it being used in Gladiator, so we did the 3D reconstruction. Um, there's the Colosseum as in the old days. And then you see the, uh, the inserted... Uh, inserted uh, um, uh, computer-generated uh, stuff that they did. So um, I worked with Sony on uh, the iToy, and we did um, virtual reality games, sold uh, quite well. And uh, also, um, uh, I uh, helped uh, uh, from the uh, offset uh, of an uh, uh, autonomous car company in the UK. We ran an uh, autonomous car uh, service in uh, Croydon. and. Um, uh, you know, this, uh, this was uh, acquired by Bosch uh, for a, a nice sum. So um, that, that's kind of just summarizing maybe why you should listen to me. Uh, I'm not, you know, um, I've been involved in the, uh, in the sort of uh, academic and commercial side of machine learning and computer vision. And um, I guess uh, one of the sort of uh, conclusions that I might come to is actually, even though I've been uh, kind of like uh, an arch capitalist, is actually uh, maybe for the future with AI, um, that's not the right, uh, the right approach. Um, so what have we seen? I mean, everyone was surprised by the, uh, the rise of chat GPT. I guess, uh, you know, uh, people um, were pretty much falling out of their seats with the capabilities that it had. And, uh, and you know, what made it work? Well, um, previously, uh, you know, GPUs developed for uh, the gaming industry allowed, uh, allowed uh, you know, cheap compute. And then this old algorithm, neural networks, you know, exactly uh, usable on GPUs, uh, big data from the internet. Um, and, you know, uh, to make ChatGPT work as well, so huge amounts of data scraped off the internet. And then, you know, people um, who were like uh, doing this um, uh, feedback, human annotators saying, this is a good answer, this is a bad answer. Um, uh, OpenAI use those to great effect to allow uh, ChatGPT. And, you know, that's really, um, you know, everyone uh, woke up to AI, I think, at that point. Um, and so, you know, we've seen big progress in AI, um, slightly slower progress in robotics, but, you know, we're getting um, really big push, huge investment this year into all sorts of humanoid robots for, uh, for uh, uh, you know, the next five years. Um, uh, Elon Musk, uh, you know, has uh, got the Optimus, and he says, you know, uh, in three to five years, he'll be deploying like a humanoid robot for $20,000. Um, I find that hard to believe because, um, you know, software and AI can progress faster because it isn't hardware dependent. Um, developing hardware takes longer. And actually, um, you know, the question that was put forward before about, you know, when will we have um, robots that are doing the floor and the dishes? I mean, we could do that now. It just costs about, you know, maybe a hundred or two hundred thousand um, dollars. And so it's really pushing the price down. Um, I don't think it'll happen in three to five years, but there's such a big push. It is going to happen. And it's going to have big consequences for our society. Um, so uh, one of the big consequences is, OK, chat GPT scraping the internet, and then a little bit of human intervention allowed it to improve its performance. Um, now imagine, you know, maybe 50 years down the line, we've got mass deployed robots. These robots are talking to you, they're interacting with you, they're, you know, uh, you're instructing them to do things. Now, the type of data that we'll give will be qualitatively different from the type of data you're getting from the internet. So, you know, when it's scraping the internet, it's just looking at news articles, but there's no interaction. Now imagine a robot can observe you, it can observe its environment, so it's storing all that video data. It can ask you questions and you can give answers. It can tell, it can actually get a reward of whether it's doing something right or wrong. So you can use other techniques like reinforcement learning to improve its communication in real time. Um, I actually believe this will lead to a ne you know, the next quantum leap in our um, ability to uh, uh, 
to processing that and maybe quantum computers, which uh, I won't talk about now. But I think that, um, um, you know, there's this, uh, this thing that if we, um, if we have a lot of data, you know, uh, a bit like, uh, I thought I'd put the physics analogy in here, but, you know, um, with data is a bit like our lever. And if we've got a lot of data, we could lever most problems. So um, this is why I think AGI will probably happen. Um, you know, we're going to have this, uh, this great uh, quantum leap in, uh, in the sorts of type of data we get. That's been our sort of uh, limiting factor. And um, I think, uh, what do I mean? You know, what does it mean, artificial general intelligence? Well, uh, you know, being a professor, I, uh, the first thing I do is always look at Wikipedia to find out, uh, you know, what it actually, how people are defining it. And I guess um, it uh, means performing, uh, uh, according to Wikipedia, as well or better uh, as uh, on humans on a wide uh, variety of cognitive tasks. And, you know, how far are we? Five years, 10 years, 20 years. In the, in the scheme of like, uh, you know, human uh, evolution and uh, societal change, it doesn't really matter. It will come. Um, not to be confused, I just thought I'd throw this in, with it being conscious. So I think there's, a, you know, there's kind of a mapping you could actually make, which says if you can run it on a computer, you know, that's just like a big calculator. So if you think uh, a computer is conscious, you think maybe a calculator is conscious. You could also make a calculator with gears, wheels, like, a, like some sort of clockwork. So if you think uh, that calculator is uh, conscious, you probably think that a clockwork clock is uh, conscious to some, to some level. Um, anyway, coming back, um, you know, we've... Um, we're seeing already huge progress that uh, AI is uh, you know, developing drugs. And I think in the future, if we get to AGI, because it will be able to, by definition, perform um, you know, tasks as well as humans, it could be running our companies. Um, uh, we'll have you know, potentially uh, assistants that can be our lawyer, our accountant, our, our doctor, our life coach, our advisor. Um, you know, it sounds, sounds good, maybe. Um, and, you know, actually, uh, you know, I looked up um, uh, some of the things that people were worried about. And actually, although it sounds good, there's actually a lot of people are worried. So, um, so Brian here uh, actually, you know, correctly pointed out some of the worries, which actually, when I talk to people out of big tech, are really echoed. So the potential for AI to cause evil is obviously incredibly huge. Um, People uh, can die if AI gets involved in politics, world domination. And, um, you know, coming back, um, so this is uh, Jeff Hinton, who's the godfather of, uh, of uh, uh, machine learning, or at least deep learning. And I think, um, you know, I think Gary Marcus is going to talk a little bit about some of these in more detail. So I won't, uh, I won't labor them, but, um, you know, we have a lot of um, potential problems which can be created. So uh, misinformation. Um, a big one that's you know close to my heart is the near-term risks of what happens if everyone, you know lots of people lose their jobs. What are we going to do in society? How are we going to address this? Um, there's also the danger now that. Uh, uh, you know, I work in computer vision, so I'm very aware of it. Mass surveillance. We have almost surveillance capitalism in which, you know, we're kind of freely giving away information to companies. We could have a uh, camera surveillance. Um, we could sleepwalk into an Orwellian state. And, you know, we have to actually be vigilant against this. Um, one thing, uh, another thing is also, um, you know, lethal autonomous weapons. Um, you know, we're seeing them deployed in, uh, in Gaza. Um, uh, if uh, there's a, a sort of a military advantage to deploying AIs, you know, imagine small armies of drones that could take out certain races. People will do that. And if they're automated, who's going to control that? You know, the US is going to deploy a lot of them, and they're saying there'll be some sort of oversight. But if these things are moving, you know, faster than humans can react, is that oversight really going to be that good if there are millions of them? Um, uh, Cybercrime and deliberate pandemics, discrimination and bias. Um, yeah, so there are, there, are, there are a few problems. So let's look at, um, you know, uh, and I'm going to so, uh, suggest some solutions, by the way. So normally when people talk about risk and existential risk, they sort of, you know, uh, 
in fact, even Jeff Hinton in his talk, his solution was, well, maybe you know, people like me, more machine learning researchers should work on AI safety. But that ignores the fact that this is a whole societal problem. So, um, you know, probably the best thing I can do is talks like this, where I talk to um, you know the electorate about the issues, because uh, it will be you guys through voting and uh, activism who can change these things. Anyway, back to um, this new industrial. You know, we're in a new industrial revolution. Previous industrial revolution created a lot of jobs, but also a lot of pain as well as people transitioned. Um, you know, I think there still will be people. People will put a premium on things that are human designed, you know, crafts and arts. There'll be influencers. And also, I think there'll be a lot of people, you'll still need trained lawyers and people like this to oversee AI decisions. And, uh, you know, I think that should always be enshrined a right to um, some sort of human decision. Um, we could work less, you know, like if we, if we, there could be a utopian vision where we might be able to work less. The Middle Ages, apparently people worked 10 to uh, 15 hours, um, you know, so we have like a nice sort of pastoral scene. So um, I think that, uh, you know, that could be good, but it's not good if people don't have much money, you know, if, so we have to also think about how we um, divide wealth in society if we're moving into um, a new area where there's this big shift of jobs. Um, and also, you know, people might not want to work less, you know, that sort of existential angst of existence probably drives us all to work. There must be a reason why people do it, right? Um, so, uh, we're, we're coming to this revolution, but what we're observing is that actually um, there's a massive concentration of power in um, uh, big uh, tech companies. They control what we see on social media and news and search. Um, many people are in the younger generations. That's their main source of news. So they're really within um, uh, some sort of uh, you know thing where they could go down a rabbit hole of radicalization or misinformation. Um, uh, the, you know, they fund uh, research at universities. So. Uh, I haven't named any companies in this because I get uh, funding from Google and Meta and all of these guys and I don't want to lose it. But, uh, you know, uh, so if, uh, if, uh, if they're watching, you know, I love you really. Um, and there are a lot of good people in these companies. Uh, they donate huge sums to uh, political parties uh, of all stripes. So. Uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, this, uh, this little cartoon of, uh, of this donation, and I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. Uh, so a little teaser there for you. So, you know, we're, what we're ending up is in a, a situation, there's these big tech companies, they're buying all of, the, yeah, including my startup, they're buying all of the new sort of tech companies going up because they've got so much money. They've got a lot of data. They've got a lot of power. Um, you know, there's a danger we could slip into a hereditary uh, oligarchy, you know, so I don't get money from Tesla. So, you know, imagine like um, at some point, perhaps um, Elon Musk succeeds and uh, he has uh, these robots they're doing a lot of the jobs and um, you know he has all this data and um, you know then he dies his son takes it over you know his granddad you know it basically becomes like a hereditary oligarchy so um, Milton Friedman like very interesting guy uh, I don't necessarily agree with him, uh, but it's really interesting to look at his view on capitalism. And he says the only social responsibility of business is to make profit. So can we trust necessarily big tech to have you know, our best interests at heart? For instance, um, somebody like uh, Facebook could stop people going down the rabbit hole by not letting them feed on you know, the same sorts of stories and going further and further into it. Um, you know, they could make interventions to do that. Um, if, you know, if something is going to make the company money, they're probably not, it's not in their duty to their shareholders to do that. So they're not working for social good. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess, um, you know, past examples where tobacco companies sponsoring research saying, you know, tobacco doesn't cause cancer and all companies sponsoring research, uh, you know, saying uh, that, uh, you know, uh, climate change is going to be fine, you know, stuff like that. Okay, so capitalism, 
like uh, is to motivate people and to make markets efficient. So Adam Smith, uh, you know, it's not from benevolence to butcher, the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner, but you know, in regard to their own, own interests. Now, supposing, as I say, we've got to a point where we actually don't, um, you know, Robe, uh, big AIs are running companies. They're designing the products. They're doing all of this. Um, we can actually just set that AI and say, really, you know, we could have a few competing AIs, and they can just um, be optimized, and they would do it better than humans. Is it then fair that you know the um, the uh, fruits of that should belong to one person? So what can be done? So. Um, you know, some of the big tech companies and people, and actually I've just written a big position paper on uh, this, are basically saying what they call democratization of AI. That means to make it open source, to allow everyone to use it. Um, I think um, actually there are different phases. So what I'm talking about is maybe in the further future when we've got to AGI. But in the, in the short term future, this is probably good because it allows people to make uh, scientific progress, to use their models in all sorts of different sciences. So I think it's not necessarily bad. But, um, you know, coming uh, uh, a bit later, supposing we have like super AIs that can make some sort of pandemic that, uh, you know, can uh, design uh, new viruses that might wipe out certain sectors of the population. Well, we definitely don't want that open source. If it can, you know, control drone armies or, or, uh, or uh, you know, do uh, bad cyber attacks or create huge amounts of misinformation, we certainly don't want that open source. So, so I think that, um, this, uh, this is a little bit um, you know, of the opposite of democracy, because democracy would be people deciding what are the limits of AI and what should be allowed and what shouldn't be. Just allowing anybody to do anything is probably a bit like giving everyone a gun, because you know, they can just have this super AI that can tell them how to do a cyber attack or break into a bank or something. Um, so coming back now, um, we're getting to a point where maybe a few big tech companies are dominating the situation. Um, could we break them up? Um, well, there are a lot of antitrust actions going in. Uh, and this is a, a picture. I think Roosevelt went up against um, a lot of the big monopolies when uh, he was against the, uh, uh, broke up the rail barons and the, uh, the banks and oil. Um, but I think this is a little bit different because once you have um, something that is uh, kind of as interwoven as a, uh, as a general AI, it's going to be hard to break it up. So um, let's move maybe a little bit more to what, where my thinking is. Should AGI become a utility? In fact, Ohio State has just put a, um, uh, a lawsuit in claiming that Google is uh, a utility because everybody has to use search. You know, so this is actually now, well, what is it actually? I better tell you what a utility is. So uh, a utility is an organization that provides some sort of essential service, electricity, telephone, water service, uh, and are generally quite monopolistic. And, you know, it could be argued that some uh, of the big tech companies, you know, within their particular area actually have reached that point. You know, if you're buying things online, you go to Amazon. If you're, uh, if you're, uh, if you're uh, using social media, maybe it's uh, Meta or Instagram. So, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, thought. Um, so. You could treat them as utilities, which uh, you know could still be a private company but regulated, or you could, you know, you could nationalise uh, something. So here's a, a little cartoon, you know, from the banks saying, obviously, you know, if they were nationalised, uh, uh, that the government would make a much worse mess than they did. Um, but I think, um, you know, uh, it was great at uh, Jean-Michel Jarre's uh, concert that he, uh, he highlighted Edward Snowden. And actually, um, you know, we, we're seeing politicians, uh, you know, great politicians like Boris Johnson in England and, uh, and uh, you know, Trump in America, who are really moving the needle on what's uh, acceptable. And, you know, I think... Um, 
what we have to think is if we're going to stress test our uh, world. So I guess um, most of you have heard of Rupert Murdoch, his phone hacking, the things he did. So imagine if somebody like Rupert Murdoch was, or worse than Rupert Murdoch, was running big tech. And then you combine that with somebody who's worse than Trump in, uh, you know, in power. Um, you could see that uh, you know, there could be potential for huge misuse of uh, AI. So we have to maybe, you know, we have to think about how do we make institutions that are going to be stress tested against that sort of thing. Um, okay, so my suggestion would be actually to have the really great examples of public institutions that are independent, um, have strong independent governance. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm from the UK and actually I work a lot with the BBC. They get the elite of the people uh, applying to them. They have a mission, which is you know, to be unbiased and uh, impartial uh, and to help uh, educate the, uh, uh, the public. They're independent but accountable uh, to uh, the government and they work towards um, public good. And there's lots of organizations like this. So I guess in the US, um, you know, it could be things like NASA or, or you know, we had this amazing talk um, before about the uh, Environmental Defense Fund showing what, you know, motivated independent people can do. So I think I would probably imagine, you know, big tech going to some sorts of you know, maybe we could all be shareholders and share in the profits um, of uh, some sort of uh, uh, publicly owned uh, and independent body. And this hurts me because, you know, I, I've, I've commercialized and I kind of like, uh, I like being uh, entrepreneurial, but um, yeah. Um, now, how would we govern those? You know, well, Democracy could do with a bit of a shake-up as well because, you know, we've got this old system where maybe we have like two parties and to get elected you need lots of million dollars, you need big donors who you're going to be in uh, debt to and, you know, you're going to pay back later. Um, and, you know, it kind of seems like, um, you know, you look at America, right, there's two uh, doddering like uh, front runners. Um, uh, it's very difficult to actually uh, stand or, you know, move outside of the party system. Um, you know, a bit like an elected dictatorship. Um, and so what about taking it back to the Athenians? We have modern technology now. We have actually the ability where we can actually all interact with democracy directly. And I think Taiwan is an amazing example of this. So what they've done is they've, uh, you know, allowed people to um, interact online. So people, they did this for AI, AI regulation, so people could... Uh, uh, and also they now have, um, for laws, you can basically propose new laws, people can vote on them. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it's also in, uh, in uh, Switzerland they do this. But I think, you know, with the power of the internet and AI, and there's another interesting uh, uh, people, uh, polis, who try to also uh, use AI to understand people's opinions, to try to help form policy. And I think there's a, a lot of... Um, uh, you know, because say no, I'm going to vote in England. You know, there are two parties. I like some policies. I don't like others. I'd love to be able to just say, here's what I think should be done. And, you know, people can say yay or nay. And I think we have the technology to do that. And that would also be how I'd like to see these um, AI companies governed. You know, do we, do we want, uh, you know, our children protected? And how do we want them protected? We can propose things and we can actually feed back straight to them. Um, in order to do this, you know, somebody had some doubts on this, said, what, you're going to let the public decide policy? This is terrible. So, um, uh, obviously, I think there's really, um, you know, huge amounts of importance for education. And I think, uh, you know, AI has a great part to play. It, at some point, my, my imagination is that, you know, there'll be a sort of, you know, a British AI or, or a, an American AI, uh, which is centrally controlled um, and would actually help, you know, would be available to everyone. It could help educate people, it could advise them on law, taxes, you know, all of those things. Um, yeah, uh, AGI helper for everyone. 
So um, I also think, you know, if we had this AGI helper for everyone, you know, a little bit like uh, if you've ever seen Philip Pullman, you know, they had little demons that would sort of help them. Um, this would be like your AGI helper, and it could help you, like, sift through misinformation. Um, it could advise you on all sorts, of, uh, all sorts of other issues around this. And I think having, um, you know, public ownership and control hopefully avoids some of the things like uh, mass surveillance. Um, so just coming back, I found, uh, you know, um, uh, Audrey Tang, who is uh, uh, Taiwan's Minister of Digital Affairs, actually really inspirational in the way that she thinks about AI and the AI future. And, uh, you know, um, I think, uh, you know, she says, when we see the Internet of Things, let's uh, make it the Internet of V. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. And um, when we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. So what does this, what does this mean? Well, at the moment, when you're um, you know, interacting with these AI systems online, they're trying to get money out of you. They're trying to influence your behavior to see adverts, to buy things. But what about if we actually had you know, a system like this, but working for the public good? So instead of like uh, trying to uh, you know, extract a book from you, it was trying to help you and educate you. Uh, when we see user experience, let's make it a human experience. When and whether a singularity is near, let's always remember the plurality is here. Um, Conclusion, I'm super optimistic about AI, providing you guys all vote for what uh, I think should be the right thing. Um, it's got the power to really help us. I mean, we've seen you know, things about climate change, there's some really great work on climate modeling, um, but it needs to be handled carefully. You know, it's, uh, and so I'd leave you the words of actually Hawkwind, one of my favorite bands. And uh, you know, they say future generations are relying on us, and it's a world we're making now. And uh, uh, I thought Maureen Ramo had uh, you know, a great thing. I'm trying to highlight you to the issues. These are personal opinions, so you might agree or disagree, and you, know, you can come up and harangue me afterwards. Um, just vote and you know, think about the issues and what sorts of society we want to build. Okay, thank you very much.